Well, thank you very much for joining me for a conversation in these strange times, Julian. Um, much appreciated. Um, just an opportunity really to celebrate music and to, in this very weird time, to rethink about why music is a priority to us um, and, and some messages hopefully that come from that. So thank you so much for your wealth of experience in this and hopefully you don't mind me asking a few questions if that's okay. So yeah, perhaps to start off, if that's okay, I think it would be fair to say that both of us are on the same page in thinking that music is a transformational force and that's quite of widely accepted in, in many ways. So I would yes, I mean, firstly, do you agree with that and, and your idea in terms of how would you think music should be prioritised in education generally? Well, I think music should be part of a broad curriculum. It's a really important thing in people's lives. Um, and I think that children are, deserve much more than being taught one or two subjects. They need to come, come out of school um, at 18 with a wide knowledge of life. And music is very much central to, I think, most people's lives. I mean, everyone would say um, that they had a soundtrack to their lives. You know, I, I get people coming up to me saying, uh, you know, I, I'm not musical. And I say, um, but I'm sure you like me. Oh, yes, I like music. And what they really mean is they can't play. Um, but and I, I think that really, that it could be that there's too much focus in a way on, on people playing instruments. I think it's wonderful that they do. But I think the most important thing is that they come out of school with an appreciation of music of all kinds, not just classical music, but they come up with a knowledge of something which is so special. And I think particularly at, at these times can yeah. be something really important for people um, to lean on, you know, whereas maybe mathematics, great as it is, is um, won't give them the same spiritual satisfaction as hearing a, a piece of music that means a lot to them. Yeah, well, I'm sure there'll be maths teachers that may disagree with you, but I'm sure there'll be many that do too. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate all that, thank you. So in terms of you talked about how it's kind of a soundtrack to your life, um, obviously you're a very famous musician and a celebrated musician. Um, and obviously you could go on and talk about this for a long time, but generally in a nutshell, how would you define how music has had an impact on your life and perhaps more broadly what do you think music has taught you? Well um, music certainly taught me discipline. Um, as, a, as a young child I was extremely undisciplined um, I, or, on, or across the range of school subjects and I think when I became more fascinated by the cello and actually technically learning it it helped all my other subjects because I, I had to introduce that discipline because I, I, I wanted to improve. And so therefore that actually affected all, all my other school subjects. And I think I, I became more organized. Uh, I think my thinking became more organized because you know, playing a musical instrument is a very com complex activity. I mean, you use obviously lots of different physical uh, muscles and, and memory and um, but it, it's also very much a mental thing of how you control it um, and if you're going to get better you have to learn how to practice and how to to organize your at, at school often very limited practice time and so I think that's something I learned was organization from yeah. from uh, it and discipline. Do you think it's for you, was it more of a personal thing or was it a social thing or was it a bit of everything? Well, of course, um, there's a great social aspect to music making, um, particularly with orchestra. But, you know, you will come into contact often with people who aren't in your age group, who aren't in the same class as you at school. And often I, I remember as a younger boy, you know, actually being, I think, dare I say, I was leading the cello section when there were the older boys through four years um, above in the classes behind me. And that's actually, that's an extraordinary experience because you're leading people um, who are, are much, much older and senior to you, which is, you know, that's what music can do. And I think that's, that's what's been shown, particularly with orchestral music. It really does bring people together. I mean, I've been extremely involved with the In Harmony program in England, and I saw for myself absolute transformation, not just of the children, but of the schools. Um, there were two schools, particularly I'm thinking of in London, in, in Lambeth, um, poor schools, that it was almost a uh, kind of a gang culture that, that one school wouldn't speak to the other. And if you went to that school, your parents didn't mix and all that. The music uh, was focused on both the schools 
and it completely transformed them. And I think that's been well documented um, that suddenly parents from those schools have got together. I mean, music can transform in a way, I think that some other subjects, not necessarily. I mean, you could point to sport and say, well, that does, but at the end of it all, sport is supposed to be competitive. And I think it, it could in some ways, you know, um, exacerbate the rivalry. Um, and music is not that. Music is working at something bigger than yourself as an individual, um, coming together with other people to produce a great result. Great, thank you. Um, I guess one of the things that we're really conscious of is trying to make sure that music is for everyone. We've got, uh, you know, in our schools, yeah. quite a, a diverse catchment and cohort of students, and we want to celebrate that rather than force something in one particular direction. Obviously, your experience as a cellist is perhaps from more of a traditional point of view. You touched on your experience with schools with that um, initiative that you were involved in, where it was perhaps slightly different as well. So I guess the next question is really, how do we promote this sense of excellence and mastery and trying to really encourage students to be the best musicians that they can without becoming elitist? I think children need role models. Um, so I think it's very important that, you know, uh, teaching music, they need to hear and see the best. And I think sometimes seeing a video or, or, or a great performance or a great performer in any field can suddenly spark something off in a child and say, oh, I never knew you could do that. Oh, I'd really love to be able to do that. And when that, that turning point happened for me, I was about 13 and had never really practiced properly. And I saw this great Russian cellist called uh, Rostropovich, who played in London many times when I was that age. And I went to see him and I, I started to think, you know, I really want to do this for myself. So he was an absolute role model for, for me. And then I started working hard and nobody told me to. I just wanted to do it. Yeah. And I think that that's what music can do. And it's not just classical music. I mean, it could, that can go right across the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's just turn our attention to this very strange world in which we're living right now. You know, and perhaps money's tighter than ever. And government policies are being stretched and stretched and stretched and parental incomes are lower than perhaps they would like and, and all sorts of restrictions on our lives. Is music really that important right now, do you think? Yes, I think it's even more important. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I mean, that's the kind of thing musicians would say. Yeah. Um, but I think it really is even more important because life is very tough all around at the moment. And I think music can bring a sort of sense of permanence in a way. I mean, if you listen to, to music that was written sometimes three, four hundred years ago, um, Mozart, Bach, and they have a, a solidity about them that somehow you know that the, the, what we are in is a very unpleasant but definitely passing phase, yeah. it will get better. And that's, I think, the, the thing that everybody has to cling on to, whoever and whatever age they are, whatever they're doing, the children, the parents, the teachers, the staff. I mean, I know this from, from when I was at Birmingham Conservatoire, you know, it's a very difficult time. And I think the thing to cling on to is that it will pass. Um, yeah. It's not passing as, as quick as, as any of us would like. Um, you know, about, and there's lots of philosophical questions it's raised, which in the future might turn out to, to be a positive thing. I mean, I was only just thinking this morning in a, a sort of rather um, uh, depressing way. Uh, all the years that we haven't had a, a world war, you know, and the money that's been put into armaments and to researching horrible things like chemical weapons and all that, if that had been put into being prepared, prepared for this kind of event and I don't think it was we yeah. you know we've all been caught the human race has been caught unawares and yeah. that's it, it could have been avoided possibly thanks going back to sort of our um kind of our, our catchment and our situation within our schools I would say um I'm very proud of the fact that we've got hundreds and hundreds of students that are regularly engaged in music making and going back to what you said I echo totally what you said some of those are quite high standard performers some of them very much at the beginning of their journey some of those that are engaged um, in all sorts of different ways um, so I guess kind of a bit of ruthless advice really from you if if we've got hundreds of students involved in music but yet still hundreds of students yet to reach what, what should we do? 
I think they've got to hear it. They've got to see it. I think, you know, if you look at TV, for example, mainstream TV, or the kind of programmes, dare I say, that children tend to watch, you will see a very limited range of music if you see music at all. So I think it's the duty, really, or, or the, 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 it's up to teachers to inspire the children. You know, you may get a group of children or, or a type of child coming to, I'm not interested but they don't know that they're not interested. It's just they've never experienced it. And I, I think that's, that's why I use the word duty, because I think by the time children come out of school, they, they have to have a, a wide knowledge of the world and what it's all about. So that means they should know about Elvis, and they should know about Beethoven. They should know about the Beatles. They should know about jazz. Different, they, they should know when somebody says to them, well, what do you think of Elvis? They should have an opinion. Yeah. It, it, it shouldn't say, well, I don't know, well, well, who's that? That's somebody died years ago. That shouldn't be how it is. You know, music is, is something that lives forever. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important point in, as we talk about, that it, it's a soundtrack to your life, but it's also a soundtrack that goes beyond one person's life. And it is something that connects the generations. It connects peoples and ancestors and places and geographical locations and history yeah, and the future. <laughs> For me, there's something yeah. quite unique about music in that it really is, it draws a line through something that in other ways you couldn't really draw a line through it. Um, and, and that's what's really exciting to it for me. It can have an immediate emotional connection. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, and I, I don't want to be discouraged about any subject at school, and I think it's vitally important that children experience a range of subjects at school, but music is something that tends to be under threat more than some other subjects, and I think that music can have this immediate emotional reaction that could can change a child's life. Literally, one piece of music, if, if it happens to be the right one for that child, can have a huge effect on, on their future. Yeah. So if we talk about our teachers in our schools, obviously it's not an easy job right now with all the restrictions and other, other ways of doing things. Think of our four primary schools we've got at the moment. So teachers who are under a lot of pressure to try and teach 13 different types of subjects to their primary school children. And kind of going what you just said in the moment, a minute ago, it can be quite tempting for music to go towards the back of the queue if you want to get out of time. And then go to our secondary schools where we have a real mix of students, those that have music as part of their kind of DNA and part of what they know and those that really don't. So we have a real mix of teachers, those that are musical and those that would say they're not and those that are musicians and those that would say they're not. What would your advice be to our if teachers I right could, now? If Sorry? I could interrupt, yeah. um, if I could just interrupt there because you said that you have a range of teachers who are perhaps not musical. I would say they're not. Now, yeah. Maybe that, yeah. What that might mean is that they don't feel that they have the, the knowledge or the yeah. means to be able to explain it. But what, what would be brilliant for a, a teacher like that would be for them actually to, to, to um, write down a list of what music they really do like. And then maybe they could play that to the class, maybe mm. especially everything being online, and they could do maybe I don't know how many how many music lessons there would be in the week, but just for the sake of uh, argument, say there's one short music lesson every day, which is possibly unlikely. I don't know, um, but it'd be great to play a, a piece of music um, every day, a different piece, and ask the children to to listen to it and rate it, and and then you know it opens up a whole discussion yeah. as to why somebody like that, why somebody hates it. You know, I, I think it, and it's it's quite a stimulating subject, and and it will spark off all kinds of of I guess arguments between teachers and pupils, and between pupils themselves. It's actually quite fun. Absolutely, and I, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head for me as well there, in that if as educators we're here to get students to think, getting students to kind of engage with their own opinions and disagree with other people's opinions, or be open to having their ideas changed then music can really be part of that journey, not just about playing the piano or the cello or the drums, as important as that is, but a wider conversation around why music is such an important part of our lives, not just our education, our daily learning, if you like. That's really, really important. I've recently been part of this government panel into looking at the um, national curriculum of music in schools um, yeah. which has been a fascinating um, exercise and I believe it's fine 
originally supposed to be published in November, but then um, I think uh, we'll see. Uh, it's been a long time. I've, I've seen the whole thing. I've seen the whole list of repertoire, which is huge. I mean, this is just suggestions, really. And I, I mean, you could really go on forever, but there are a whole load of suggestions of different styles and different types of music for teachers to play. And what I think is interesting is that um, for the teachers who perhaps are not sort of specialized, It'd be great for them to listen to those pieces of music and again select the ones that they like get a discussion going because i supposing there was a situation like you could play one piece of music a day um and you the, then the surely the answer would be to play very different styles very different styles of music not just classical and um, e even if there were two or three classical not the same styles of classical yeah. because after all we're talking about 700 years of music which yeah quite you know, cool. <laughs> and then get reactions, you know, and yeah. get children to say, you know, say an example for, I, I give you that, the, the, the fast second movement of Shostakovich's 10th symphony. It's about five minutes long. It's a crazy kind of tour de force, which a lot of people would say, oh, this is, you know, tanks rolling in somewhere. But, you yeah. know, great to play that to children. And, and if one of them said, oh, I can't stand this, and, you know, to, to find out why. To yeah. stimulate their thinking as to say why I don't like that or why I really loved it. You know, I think I think it's a fascinating subject. Absolutely. So if you were going to sum up now, kind of some advice now to a, a group of teachers who are about to go into a second term. It's kind of a second winter term, it's darker nights, it's darker mornings. Obviously, the pandemic is still going on and, and proving some to, to provide some difficulties there. What advice yeah. would you give to our teachers right now as they embark in the second term? Well, I think music is an is a extremely emotive subject. Um, it, it, it is thoroughly emotional. So therefore, I think that they have to come from, from within themselves to select and, and to think about music that they really like and to explain to, to children what it is about that. Um, of course, it's very different to, to teaching an instrument. Um, and I think one thing that all of us uh, from the, the teaching side of music have learned is, is to sort of try and refine online teaching skills, which is a very, very different skill. Um, I found it actually, but I, I did some cello lessons with students at the, at the Royal Berwick Conservatoire, and I found it very interesting. Firstly, the, the, uh, even over this very short period of time, people seem to have learned how to you know, master the electronics and, and to, to actually get a better sound quality and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So that now, say with a Zoom call, um, you've actually got a pretty good sound quality, which is definitely a start. Um, the things I found very difficult at the beginning were actually listening to things like dynamics and volume. Everything seems to get ironed out. Um, but, you know, um, I think it, it can be done. And I think a, a lot of the the teaching was actually more focused, more intense, but because say you've got a one hour lesson with a child uh, or with a student, um, you have to really, really listen every second of that online, uh, whereas maybe attention in one to one can waver. Um, but when you actually do online, I, I think, you know, so there's pros and cons of all these things. I mean, we'd all like to be back as things were, but I think also there are times when you just have to accept it as it is and and to work with it and try to develop other skills yeah thank you so what, what last question then so what does music look like you for the next six months or so have you got any other exciting projects in the in the can or so on well personally um i'm i don't play cello anymore uh, i was teaching you know i i had to stop it because i had an injury that was an actually a terrible year from the whole of 2014 um I, I was uh, unemployed. So, you know, I also had the faith in a way that, that I knew that it would end and, and was very lucky then to get appointed at, as principal of a conservatoire. Um, but I, I did have the belief that it would end. And I think in some ways it's a similar situation. For me personally, I'm gonna do some conducting. I've, I've got concerts, big program in China um, in April, um, full symphony orchestra um, pieces, none of which I've done before. Um, but, you know, I'm looking forward to it. But of course, will it happen? I don't know. Yeah. Will, will, 
nobody from Britain be allowed anywhere. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. It, it's all up in the air. But you have to have the faith that it will pass, which it will. So even if one thing is cancelled or concerts are cancelled for six months, they will come back. Of course, yeah. I, I'm absolutely convinced of it. And that's really important to end on, really, I think, in the it's tempting to kind of just not hide behind <clears throat> the current situation, but perhaps that can become part of our language that everything's on hold while we wait for that to go. And I think we've got a duty, really, not just to put things on hold and wait for them, but actually to start planning now, to start doing things now, to perhaps rethink the way we're doing things now to ensure that we don't well, miss those opportunities. We know that the things that are taught in schools, they've been around for a long time, forever. I mean, languages, mathematics, um, music, uh, sport, these things are not just going to go away. I mean, we, uh, well, I haven't, but other, others have been through world wars. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, goodness knows if it seemed that they would ever end. I mean, all I'm absolutely certain of this will end and we'll find a way of coping with it. So in order to, to make the most of that, you've got to prepare um, uh, as if that's going to be happening. And you, you don't want to suddenly find, oh, we, we've got a vaccine now. Um, well, what are we going to do now? You yeah. have to be prepared for it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you have to look to the future. Absolutely. And what a great place to, to end the interview. So thank you for that. We'll look to the future and make sure we give our students every opportunity that they deserve and provide them with these opportunities to spark their imagination to be creative, to work with each other, to develop their linguistic skills, to develop their um, fine motor skills and all of those things that come with learning and loving music. So thank you so much for your time, Julian. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much.